So maybe I can get the conversation started with a, a quick question, uh, and this will be you know directed at Larry. But I'm curious about what all the panelists have to say. Um, so I know many of us here are interested in both material science and deep learning, and we have a you know varying amounts so, of um, dedication to both or experience with both. So if you haven't um, been looking into the deep learning side as much, you might not know that Larry is a co-creator of one of the most impactful data sets in Vision, and now he's co-creating a data set in material science. So I want to ask him um, what, how you found the two fields to be different as you're co-creating an important data set for the two of these fields. Um, do you have any recommendations from the Vision side to the material science side? or any other you know, comparisons you'd like to make? Yeah, we actually followed, um, like with the Cocoa data set, which is a computer vision data set that we developed, um, we, we borrowed some of the techniques we went from there. So there's, when you create a new data set, there's actually three things you need to do. You need to create a lot of data, uh, which is kind of the obvious one. The next one is you need to have good um, metrics. You need to say, if you're using that data and you're building machine learning models, you know, how do you know that if you did well? And developing new metrics is actually very tricky and can take months of discussion and, and the talking to figure out which ones are the best. Um, and that really was a challenge with the Open Catalyst data set because there are metrics which are kind of more geared on the machine learning community to see, you know, that way they can see progress. We also wanted metrics which the computational community could look at and say, are these metal, you know, ML, ML models actually any use to us? You know, like, are they as good as DFT, you know, um, or can they approximate DFT to the level that we needed to, to actually be useful? And then finally, you need to provide baselines. So you need to have, you know, your, your standard ML models are already trained so that way people can say like, okay, this is where we are right now and this is where we wanna to get to in the future. Now, the Open Catalyst project was a lot different from the computer vision side of things in that the computer vision data set, you know, we can just throw it out there. The machine learning community, computer vision community, they know what to do with it. You know, they, they're familiar with those problems. Where an Open Catalyst, you know, we're talking about atoms, we're talking about DFT, forces, energies. The ML community doesn't know what that is. so. You know, we had to write an introduction paper. We've been uh, hosting workshops at NeurIPS uh, and challenges at NeurIPS. We've been giving, you know, going out and giving talks. We've been basically trying to educate the, you know, the larger ML community about this problem. And it's not just like what this problem and why it's important, but it's also, you know, why this is such an interesting machine learning community, why this is something that you should be eager to work on. And that's been a challenge. And that's something that we're, you know, obviously continuing to work on. Um, but, you know, so then from that perspective, you know, the uptake, you know, number of people using the data set is not, um, it's increasing, you know, and I think I've seen really positive trends, but it's not like the computer vision where you throw something out there and it's like, you know, it just explodes. Thank you, that makes, that's very interesting. And um, one difference I see between deep learning and material science is that in deep learning, um, active learning is a topic but you don't see active learning really giving much improved results, say on ImageNet or uh, Coco. I haven't seen it at least. I shouldn't say something when you're here. But Austin, you know, really emphasized the role of active learning in their success story um, with Sepion Technologies. So I'm curious if uh, any of the panelists have thoughts on, first of all, why active learning seems to be so successful in material science, but not in deep learning, and what does that say about these data sets and how they should be shared and treated? I can take a quick stab at that, which is active learning and material science was a necessity because DFT is so expensive to compute, you didn't have a lot of data. So you wanted to be very picky about the data that you use. So active learning was a very useful technique. In computer vision and a lot of ML tech you know, domains, data is just everywhere. You have huge data sets. Right. So, and the problem was in uh, machine learning, a lot of times is you have a huge amount of data, but it's not all labeled. So unsupervised learning, you know, and self self supervised learning really were, you know, taking precedent there because you had so much data here. We don't have a huge amount of data. So I think active learning was more popular uh, in this domain versus others, more traditional ML domains. Yeah, I'm curious if there was also a domain shift, maybe uh, more than one might expect from ImageNet to application versus, you know, from Austin's original data set to Sepion's uh, target uh, compositions. So Austin, do you have any um, anything you can share about that? Yeah, sorry, Doug, could you repeat the, the last thing you said about this transformation? Like, I, do you think that active learning was so useful for 
your uh, study because there was a domain shift between what you trained on and what you were testing your models on for Sepion? Or was it more just the lack of availability of large data? I think it's I think it's really the latter. Um, we we started the study with basically no data, right? And so the the so like, the, like literally no data. Like the first round, you know, generates the first data set, and then the second round generates you know a, a data set twice as big. Um, and so I think the for us, it was really about um, just sampling the space as effectively as possible, uh, and and kind of doing this classic you know explore exploit. Um, a trade-off of just trying to get to the best performance with the minimal number of experiments, because as Larry said, you know, each, whether it's a DFT calculation or it making an electrolyte, putting it in the cell, putting it on test, letting it run for a month, like these are all super expensive uh, data, you know, acquisition steps. So in that case, it was really just, just a, uh, you know, artifact of small data. Mm -hmm. And then um, maybe I can now move on to a more controversial question. So um, Remy mentioned that um, for them, the going from black box to a glass box for machine learning was very important. And you know, I think this um, interpretability question is quite a debated topic in deep learning. Um, so if there's a very maybe I can start by asking Remy this very popular question, which is, would you prefer a 90% accurate model that's interpretable? or a 100% accurate model that's not interpretable? And in general, like if you have any thoughts about this debate. Um, so it depends on what you're trying to solve. So in our case, we are interested in, uh, so we have like three examples that we're looking at. Uh, one is electroplating, physical deposition, and laser power bit fusion. And we're looking at like this, like three manufacturing techniques because we are, you know, making components that are fielded uh, and, you know, failure of this component. So these components have to be like extremely reliable and failure is not an option. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, re it really depends on like, you know, in our case, we're really targeting materials reliability because failure can have like, you know, huge consequences on the performance of your system. Um, and, and so in our case, it's extremely important to have, you know, a process, a workflow that enables you to kind of like guarantee that like you can control your process along the way and meet the requirement, you know, the, meet the performance requirement. If you're looking at, at something which is more like, you know, materials discovery. So if I'm looking for like a new alloy that would have like, you know, some very specific uh, uh, properties, but you don't, you don't necessarily know where to start. Ha having, having like less accuracy uh, but with like a lot of like, you know, explainability and interpretability in, into your workflow, that, that's where the value, because, you know, we as like subject matter expert, we want to understand why these algorithms are making decisions, because then we can use that knowledge and then, you know, use this AI <laughs> that we have, you know, under the skull, uh, you know, to the best of its ability to actually like make decisions that maybe uh, you know, your algorithm, your best algorithm is not able to do, or maybe use your intuition that is not necessarily like built into your algorithm to then, you know, use that as like a co-pilot to make the best decision. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, definitely. Very interesting. Uh, did Austin, Michael, or Larry have any comments on interpretability or how important it is? Yeah, I, I could share a few thoughts. I, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know the answer, but I think it comes down to, um, it really comes down to like, you know, the, the, the computers are good at one thing and the, the, you know, the, the human AI, uh, as Remy said, I guess that's just I, um, is good at, as good at other things, right? It's good at, at creativity and, uh, and not the sort of rote computation. And so I guess the question becomes, you know, is your objective, can you reach your objective just by kind of a, you know, standard optimization over some maybe hugely complex, very large space. Um, if so, you probably don't really need interpretability, but I think the fact of the matter is that often as material scientists, we do some set of experiments, we learn something, and then we have to filter information back through the, the, the human creative thinking process and you know, rearrange what we're doing. Um, and in that case, I think interpretability really is important. 
Um, but I, I think it varies, you know, case by case, depending on sort of what you're, what you're working on. Um, if it's, if it really just, you know, once we hit this benchmark, we're done, you know, we've, we've, we've won the game and we pivot to the next thing, then I think it's probably okay to just, you know, have no idea what the model's doing, if the model's working. Um, but uh, that's, that's probably less common than the, you know, as Remy said, the, 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 the scenario where you want to sort of have some feedback and some, you know, back and forth with, uh, with what the, the, the AI is, is supposedly sort of looking for. So it's a tough one to answer. I don't think there's an easy answer. Can I chime in quickly and, and uh, think, ask what, what your thoughts are on whether we're overrating interpretability in the following sense. Um, interpretability, we're used to equations. So we think we understand equations, but in the early days and even today of quantum mechanics, interpretability is not a guarantee, right? Uh, and certainly that's true with relativity theory. The fact that you can write equations doesn't really mean that we understand how they work and what their limits of applicability uh, is. Large scale computing is the same thing. You really don't understand. You, you can interpret, it, it's very questionable whether you can interpret what's going on and whether you can detect there's something going wrong when you're doing a simulation with a hundred million degrees of freedom, yet we use them all the time. And so I wonder whether we're trying to subject deep learning to a higher standard than everything else. We, we think we understand more than what we really do, even in the, uh, in, with other methods. Um. One word of caution uh, that we've noticed is that when it comes to using machine learning to approximate DFT, is the machine learning models are really confident, no matter what garbage you give them. Uh, you know, you give garbage into you know standard DFT, it's not going to converge. You give it to an ML model, it's always going to give you an answer. So you have to be really careful. And it's one of the things that we've been we've been looking at different ways of trying to figure out what you know to predict what the confidence of the model is, and none of them have worked incredibly well so far. And we think it's going to be one of the barriers with like wider spread adoption of ML models because people will use it for things it wasn't trained on and then be like, this doesn't work. And we got to figure out a way to communicate to people uh, where we think it'll work and where it won't. Uh, so I do think it is a significant challenge. And just from our firsthand experience, we use machine learning models to do a large filtering. And then we always run DFT at the end, basically to verify that, you know, what the ML models said, the most promising things ML models predicted actually are like legit from a DFT perspective. And, and to, to follow on on like what Leah was saying, so th that's one thing that, you know, here at the labs, we're trying to push, which is this like, you know, glass box types of approach. Uh, and it's it's basically to kind of like give confidence where like, you know, folks that have not been exposed to this, you know, field of science before, they have, you know, they have trust in, you know, using these type of tools or you know, at least some sense of trust of using these type of tools. Um, and, and then, you know, adopting these type of tools. And if you don't have that, that key component, I think that that makes it a lot harder to have this like democratization of you know adopting this type of tool. So you know, we we need to think as a community on like how to coming up with like architectures that are interpretable and explainable. Yeah, hey, just this, wait. This, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh no, I was going to piggyback on that and say I think where we've seen interpretability um, become important is in you know, is in that um, uh, in that step where you're you're bringing someone into the into the fray who's not familiar with the approach, as Remy just said. But I think also um, in um, sort of validating um, that models uh, work uh, or have been trained correctly. There's often like a well, you know, what does this model say about the direction of the correlation of this feature? Um, you know, is it telling me that that uh, you know whatever you know, take whatever feature you want like is is the model sort of reproducing my mental model and i think that's convincing uh when it is but it, it can also be dangerous that um you know you can just sort of be reinforcing a mental model that's not right uh, or or is incomplete and is maybe not sort of fully generalizable so that's an interesting 
interesting trade-off there. Sorry, Ali, I, I cut you off. No, no, that that's perfect. And I think this is a good segue into there's been a, a very nice discussion uh, going on on the uh, Google Doc. And um, so I was wondering if I, we could start with one. And, and I think I'd, I'd like Michael to address this. And so there's been a, a question about uh, workforce development and education. And you, since you brought it up, Michael, so the, the question was, um, whether the, the panel can comment on the nature of the required skills uh, and, and possibly contrast those with traditional CS backgrounds. And, and I had a, a similar thought when you know, Remy was talking about something that I find very interesting, CS, MSc degrees. At the same time, the majority of the students we train, right? Uh, we were talking about 100,000. Uh, shortfall, the majority are going to be users of this technology and not developers of this technology. And we need to learn how to do that. Um, and because we are, we do research, we're uh, developing these tools, we tend to think, well, everyone needs to be able to uh, write this from scratch and come up with the next model. Whereas certainly at the undergraduate degree, we need to educate a very large number of students who have the capacity to be expert users of these tools and not necessarily uh, developers. And so Michael, what are your thoughts and what is uh, maybe Schrodinger doing for about these? Sure, yeah. I think it's a really interesting question and it's one that I think about quite a bit. Uh, the analogy that I like to give so I'm an experimental chemist by trade. I'm a synthetic organic chemist. Um, I, I'm not trained in uh, CS. I'm, I'm not trained in uh, physical chemistry. Uh, I was a, a bench chemist, right? And the, the analogy that I like to... <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the analogy that I like to give is uh, with certain spectroscopy equipment, right? So the, the bench chemist goes and takes NMR, the bench chemist goes and takes IR, right? But they don't necessarily know the ins and outs uh, of this equipment in, in some way, right? They didn't develop the, the uh, software that they're using to interpret, right? They, they just need the NMR to interpret the results so that they can go synthesize the next molecule or, or see what happened along the way. And I think this is the number one area in uh, what I would describe as comp chem, but more broadly, right? Molecular modeling and AI, where I think we're lacking. There's, there's a, a strong emphasis on methods development because it's a lot of it is exciting and new, uh, but there's less emphasis on training what I would call applied users uh, who don't necessarily need to be methods developers. In fact, if everybody's a methods developer, why are we developing methods? I mean, that's a, a painful esoteric question to ask, right? But uh, we see it in the field because as I mentioned, we got to companies and often they either have a methods developer or untrained material scientists or chemists who want to use tools like this. And so I think it's a huge challenge and, and I think it's uh, the responsibility of the community that is developing the methods to make sure that they're training along the way, which is hard work and sometimes thankless work. So our effort at Schrodinger has been around course development. So creating self-paced asynchronous online courses that people can take that are focused on chemists, engineers, material scientists, rather than developers. We assume that the developers actually do have more places to learn skills than do the applied users. Uh, so, so we're really interested in developing resources for that community. I think academia could do more in that space. I think some people do a lot, but um, I think it's a gap that that's fairly common. That, that, that's where I stand on it currently. Yeah, that's terrific. And just as a quick follow-up for, for maybe the other panelists is, I think it, it, we're talking about the collaboration and the interface between academia and industry. I think sharing more examples of the use of machine learning and simulation to solve real world problems. And we were talking about fair data, access to models, right? So that you don't have to spend six months getting a you know, some kind of Jupyter notebook to run and all the libraries synced up. 
I think that'll be very useful for undergraduate education, right? Where you have a problem, there's data and you can apply these tools without learning everything that's under the hood, but have examples of how they can use. So uh, I think industry has the right problems, right? And our students are interested in those pro and national labs, it, it, certainly Sandia. So the more we could share those uh, to the degree that it's possible, in a way that can be consumed by instructors without being a super expert or having access to a supercomputer, I think that would be extremely beneficial. Yeah, I, I can just uh, echo, I think, what's already been said. Um, I think my perspective. Um, on the you know being at Stanford and and sort of seeing the students who are who are coming through these programs, many of whom specifically want to go into materials informatics, you know, right from the very start. As soon as they come into the PhD, they know that's exactly what they want to do. Um, huge amounts of interest in in this now. Um, I, I think I I do share the sentiment that there is a sort of gap in um, what's being taught when it comes to you know what you need to be a practitioner of of these sorts of, of approaches and um i wouldn't say it's necessarily the case with you know graduating phd students but i think if the students who are a little earlier in their careers let's say maybe undergraduates who are coming out of these programs can often i'm surprised that the the they can know you know really deep sort of details about certain parts of the field but often have missed pretty rudimentary um, uh, elements in this in this space, and like you know, that can be as simple as you know understanding the difference between a training error and a validation error and a and a test error, right? I think that's probably the most common thing where you know we often say, hey, you know, there's th these things are not the same. This is a super super important distinction, um, but you know maybe they're an expert with with. Uh, you know, featureizing molecules and importing sklearn and all this stuff. So, I think there is a, I think there is a fine line to walk there between the the minutia of of these approaches and then just kind of the simple, um, simple details of of you know how do you how do you practice informatics versus sort of develop. Yeah, and, and someone was mentioning in the chat uh, uh, that it's one hundred percent true that. We wouldn't graduate mechanical engineers without knowing how to uh, do MATLAB or set up a finite element simulation, right? And they don't have to be an expert in finite element simulation. So if we can do that, we can certainly teach material scientists uh, to use this type of uh, tools. I also so we think have we'll about see. 20 minutes left in um, less than 20 minutes. Uh, before the break. Um, th there is another conversation, very interesting conversation and long between uh, Jan Jensen and uh, I think Remy and some others about uh, ontologies and statistical models. And so maybe that's something that we want to discuss as a group. And, and again, we want to draw um, examples of areas where we can collaborate across industry and academia and National Lab, so maybe we can stress those aspects of the conversation. So, Remy, would you like to? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, it's two, two cents of the discussion. Yeah, yeah, it's a can of worms, right? <laughs> uh, the, the ontology is really uh, a hot topic uh, or debatable topic, I should say. So. I think people sometimes tends to mix uh, the fairization of the data with like what ontology is. And the way, I mean, that's my personal view, but the, the way I see like ontology as a useful tool is like, if somehow we can coming up with like a set of defined um, descriptors that we can use to describe process, structure, property, and how they're linked, uh, that goes back to your comment about uh, interpretability and explainability, because then you can you can build a some sort of like you know a knowledge graph uh, with your nodes and you know where each node will have like some 
ontology basis associated to it. And I think that's where the real opportunity comes in, in terms of materials discovery, uh, having like, you know, almost like autonomous hypothesis driven design of experiments, uh, which is something that we're, you know, really interested here at the lab. There's a, a big push internally to kind of like starting to explore um, that direction for sure. Uh, and, and that's where I see the, you know, the opportunity, but at the same time, I recognize that uh, it, it, it is complicated. Uh, you know, a lot of people have been spending a lot of time thinking about like, you know, large language models and, and things like that. But, you know, in, in terms of like trying to embed your knowledge using this type of ontology with this like knowledge graph, et cetera, to me, that, that that's a real opportunity. How we solve that, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I should say that I was really glad that none of the panelists brought up ChatGPT. <laughs> it's really uh, uh, encouraging because, and I think this goes back to what Michael said, which was like one of the, my favorite things I heard. You know, I think too much of us just develop methods, too many of us develop methods, but then like we're not using the methods, which is a bad sign. And then like, what is the ultimate goal for these methods? And I think this is similarly with the ontology question. Like, we should really derive. Uh, drive the project with a goal, like say, as Larry's team is doing, we want to discover new catalysts. And then if LLM is a useful tool, that's great. But um, I worry that more of the projects are like, uh, let's do an LLM project. And then what's the goal? We don't actually have a goal. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's very interesting. Um, speaking I, of, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead, please. No, no, you go ahead. Ali. I was going to say, uh, following up on what you were saying about, you know, we, we want our models to be useful, right? And uh, I, I'm old enough that w when I was a grad student and doing molecular dynamics, we used to, it was one paper, one code, right? We would write the code from scratch, write one paper and then toss it away, write another code from scratch. And then labs came along, comes along and they do a code that beats all of our codes combined and that's it. And now we're as a community much more mature and efficient. And I, I, I feel like uh, the field of, of data and, and machine learning, somewhat like that, right? That it's one model per problem, very reuse is tiny. It's very, very limited. And I was wondering maybe Michael, you know, companies like Schrodinger do that, right? So they, you cannot write a piece of code for every problem that your customers have. So you have general solutions. Uh, do you see that happening, that evolution in the AI uh, or, or ML so that, you know, as a community across national labs and industry and academia, we can start actually develop, developing products. Chat GPT is, a, is a, an example of that, uh, that actually work across the board or, or doesn't work across the board, whichever way you want to see yeah, I mean, that that's always our goal is to productize and um, make sure it's useful. And so our approach with with ML and AI has been to productize it in the same way that we productize our DFT tools and our MD tools. You know, it's to to put things under the hood and make it as user friendly as possible. Um, but I would say we're still pretty early in what we've incorporated. And so there is room for identifying the best useful methods to then um, incorporate into tools like ours. And I think that the community will move in that direction where these sort of softwares like LAMPS is a good analogy, will come around uh, for, for AI ML. And, and we're moving in that direction, but I'd say we're still in the early stages of it. So I imagine others will move in that direction as well. One thing I'd also expect over the next two to three years is another AI fields, you basically see a transition where like, if you want to do something there, you have to be a model developer. You have to train your own models because none of the models out there are that accurate or that good. And I think we're kind of in like a transition phase, you know, in, in chemistry material science in that regard, in that I would probably in another year or so, we'll see models coming out that do work quite well, that people don't need to actually look underneath the hood as much and can just use them. So I think the amount of the, the technical depth and knowledge that you need from an ML side of things will you know, decrease as time goes on. Uh, at least that's my expectation because we've seen it you know, in other domains as well. 
And in terms of these uh, shifts that we're observing, something else I noticed is uh, Michael on his slide mentioned, I think that some of the uh, calculations have been done on a, like an industry cloud service. And I know that Austin also has experience running both on national lab computers and on cloud. And I, I suspect Larry's uh, workloads are on something that is like cloud. Uh, does any of you have thoughts on like what this could mean? Like I can imagine, for example, national lab computers being better at running 10,000 atom simulations, whereas cloud workloads being better for high throughput 50 atom simulations. Do you see a transition? Do you think that's um, like going to add some diversity to our workloads? That's an interesting question. I, I will say from, from our perspective, we have um, recently just begun running everything on uh, you know industry maintained cloud services like like AWS and others. Um, partially, I think I think you're probably right that that that's not the most efficient um, for like really large calculations. Um, but partially, frankly, we just see a lot less overhead. Sort of you know administrative overhead to do those calculations on something like AWS. It's easy to just ramp it up and ramp it down. Um, we don't have to report anything to anyone, um, and uh, so I, I think you know I'm certainly not the authority on this, but but that's sort of what we've seen. And we would love to run stuff on big giant clusters elsewhere, but um, there just has been a little bit more headache involved in kind of getting time on those on those servers. So that's why we've we've avoided it. Yeah, we, we're shifting towards the cloud, and I would say that most of our customers prefer the cloud as well. Um, cost, overhead, admin, th these are the reasons that we're seeing that shift. And and again, this, this non-expert discussion user, it's just another thing that most people who are applied users don't understand. And so if you can set them up in a cloud environment instead of them having to have an IT team build and maintain a cluster, this is easier for, for use. I also think we'll see a big shift just due to the computational efficiency of the ML model versus, you know, doing things with DFT or other approaches is when you do something and it's, you know, a hundred times or a thousand times less expensive, it really kind of changes the equation, I think, and how you think about using, you know, certain computational approaches at least. Yeah, I also kind of appreciate having kind of like a dollar amount associated with it. Like, I guess it's helpful for people to know how much it costs relative to how much like engineering hours cost. Whereas like, um, but on the other hand, we're finding it very difficult to run, you know, really large simulations, which would also hopefully be a future for us, like where we run actual interfaces, actual grain boundaries that are large. Um, so it'll probably be really good to have both of them kind of developed together and then give us uh, options. Do we, um, if you still have a few more minutes, can I ask uh, another potentially um, um, controversial question? Do you all, do you four, or Ali too, if he's interested, um, feel like computation and ML so far have impacted and accelerated experiments in line with how much resources have gone into them? And if not, why do you think not yet? I can start answering that question. So it's not just ML as like an accelerator for you for what you do, but um, so one thing that we're pushing, for example, at the labs is coming up with like alternative uh, characterization techniques uh, that would be like low resolution but high throughput that would contain the same type of fingerprints that you would get from like low throughput high resolution characterization technique. So it's not just like, you know, that ML helps. It's not just the ML component that accelerate, you know, what you do, uh, but it also comes on, you know, the data collection and the type of data that, you, that you're coming up. Um, so just to give you an example. So for example, like we're combining different types of data modalities. Uh, and the hypothesis behind that is like, when you combine different types of modalities, you can uniquely fingerprint uh, you know, specific processes that we're interested in. Uh, and that's where the real acceleration comes in. 
So now you, you can mix and match different types of like, you know, high throughput characterization uh, where you, you, you can collect, you know, thousands and thousands of data points where if you were to use like a high resolution, let's say TEM, for example, it would take you, you know, you can maybe collect 20 images and then you're happy. Um, so, you know, it's not just the ML, it's like ML and all the infrastructure that's associated with it. You're you're muted, Larry. Intentional muting. <laughs> I'll, I'll add uh, something, which is as I mentioned in the the first slide I showed. We work with a lot of different industries, and one thing just to to speak to your question is, I think some industries are seeing more application faster than other industries. So. An example of an industry where it is clearly useful quickly would be like OLED, um, where uh, the properties are maybe more straightforward, if, if that makes sense. Um, and an area where it's much more complicated, but we do have interest would be like formulations, um, where we're still relying on MD and course craning and, and because developing ML models for you know, why is this shampoo viscosity uh, as such s seems to be much more uh, uh, more slow moving. And so I think we're seeing a, an industry pattern uh, in this uh, adoption and effectiveness rate. We also have Perfect. adopted how we think about using ML models based upon different verticals that we've been looking at. Because sometimes you can do a lot of experiments uh, experimentally in other domains. It's really hard to do an experiment. You know, it's a difference between being able to do 10 or 100 a day versus doing, you know, 10 to 100 a year. So depending on that, we kind of take a different philosophy. You know, if it's more of a screening or if it's more of a, a cycle, you know, where you're feeding back the experimental data and using that to update your ML models. I think, you know, this, it, it's just hard. I think th things are just harder on the experimental side, you know, so it's just difficult to... Um, you know, make a lot of progress there in, in, in the fast pace. There, there was a, another interesting question in the uh, Google Doc that Larry addressed a little bit, but I think it relates to some of the discussion we're having about reusing models, which is this idea of transfer learning, right? So can we create basic models trained on a bunch of across the board to, to predict specific properties that then you use as a subset of your model that you uh, you use for whatever your uh, ultimate quantity of interest might be. Is that an, a, a way in which we can maybe start reusing these models without worrying too much about what's under the hood and uh, using transfer learning to do that? You have a library of models that predict a bunch of things and you use them uh, to uh, as a subset of your 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 model. And just a little background on that: we've been doing experiments where we'll train a model on OC20, OC22, which has you know I think millions of relaxations and hundreds of millions of you know DFT data points. And then we take another data set which maybe only has a thousand examples in it, and we can basically train a model on these larger data sets to build like good representations of atoms, etc and then basically fine tune them on these smaller data sets. And generally you'll do better than what you would do if you just trained on that smaller data set. And I think the trick here is, is to, that that bigger model is to make it small enough so that way anybody can fine tune it just using a small number of GPUs and to make that whole process as kind of seamless as possible. So that way you don't, again, you don't have to be an ML expert to be able to do that. So you can just create your thousand or 10,000 10, training points you know, fine tune it, kind of plug and chug, and then hopefully it'll work for your application. Yeah, I, I think that's a very promising uh, overall approach. But I also think it's dependent upon having more and more of these larger data sets to initially train your models. Because OC20 and OC22, I don't think are enough. So getting more data sets of that type will be important, I think, for the overall community. Uh, so that reminds me of a, a comment I was going to make actually right during your first question, um, Doge, to, to Larry about the sort of standardized data sets. Um, 
I just really like this paper and I thought I would share it. Um, it's from um, Chris Bartel. It's called a, a Critical Examination of Compound Stability Predictions from Machine Learned Formation Energies. I will post it in the chat because that's a very long name. Um, <clears throat> but I think this is a, a really nice paper that we could use more of this type in the community, which, which basically did a, a real objective analysis of you know, this data set and this model um, you know, and gives this error on this on this you know test set, and this this data, this model gives this error on the same data, uh, same you know test set. So I think just doing a really objective analysis of all of the things that have been put out there, I think this touches on a lot of the points that we've made today about you know not just standardizing data sets, but also how do we kind of correct for this? Um, not correct, but how do we? Um, work with this tendency to sort of, you know, write a model and then and sort of put it out in the in the world and never use it again. Um, I think I think the the, the work that um, like Larry and others are doing of trying to sort of standardize these these data sets on which one can benchmark different models is, is really important work. And um, and I think this is a, this work from Bartel at all is a really nice um, demonstration of that. Thanks. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's also one of my favorite papers, also because it really supports what Michael said, where I think if those models are taken to the actual application of discovering stable materials, then you notice that the small formation energy prediction error doesn't translate to stability prediction error. But if you don't take it that next final step, then you don't notice that. 